I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to our moderator for the day, Mr. Martin LeBlanc, who among many, many, many accolades, um, he is on our steering committee. And so we're so honored that you have been uh, an advisor to our organization and a partner for so many years. Um, so thank you for sharing your expertise with us and, and all of your collaborators today. So with that, I'm just turning it over to you. Take it well, away. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate it. And first of all, thank you all for joining us. I mean, it's a, a tough time, we all know, and I want to give everyone just, I hope everyone is safe and healthy uh, in an age of COVID. And you know, when you think of the age of COVID, what's, what's a better word to kind of have as a, a bookend of that than play? Um, and that's why I'm so proud to be on the steering committee of the U.S. Play Coalition. I really do want to take a second just to thank Stephanie. Um, I mean, this has been such a turnaround in a month from a, a conference that was supposed to start April 1st and then to turn this into a virtual gathering. And, you know, being on some of these Zooms, I've seen that this has become a community. So I just really want to take that time, Stephanie, to thank you. It's an honor to be on the U.S. Play uh, Coalition Advisory Board. Have to get in my Go Tigers uh, on that. And also, we think we have a special person on our, on our Zoom today, and that is Fran Manila, uh, who is the first female National Park uh, Superintendent. It is also her birthday. We already gave her a, uh, a little bit of a shout out. But I have to say, Fran is someone who, when Fran asks you to do something, you don't say no, uh, as those of us who know Fran. And she's a doer, she's a mentor, and she's really been a leader, I think, in some of the things we're gonna talk about today. And that is really connecting play with the outdoors. Um, and so thank you, Fran, so much for, for joining us. Um, a little bit on me, I'm Martin LeBlanc. Uh, I run a strategic advisory firm out of Seattle called LBC Action. And you know, I, the, the, the Youth Outdoor Policy Playbook is perfect for what I believe in and what I'm passionate about because I'm very passionate about advocacy and I'm very passionate about partnerships. And that's really what we're trying to do. And what connects that passion between advocacy and partnerships really is the outdoors and youth. So that is why I think this is uh, so exciting. In, in my firm, I work with a lot of different groups from foundations like the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Native Americans and Philanthropy to thought leaders like the Aspen Institute and outdoor programs like the YMCA. Um, I'm a co-founder of the Children Nature Network. Folks here might have read uh, Leave No Child in the Woods by uh, Richard Lube. Um, and I'm also a young man, who, a young a person who had his life turned around as a, as a young man by an outdoor experience. So I really believe in the transformational power of the outdoors. Um, this is really going to be your time. So we really want to give people who have taken their time to engage today the opportunity to really ask questions and engage with this distinguished panel. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the format. So i uh, going to give a quick intro kind of uh, on kind of the partnership, uh, just real quick history on it, give some quick introductions. All of the uh, distinguished panelists really uh, please read their bios because, I mean, these are people that I'm learning from every day. We're going to go through a little bit of the playbook and some case studies so people can really see how youth outdoor policy has kind of come together in different regions, different states, and hopefully really give you some tools because that's what we're really about. As a, as a group is giving you those tools so you can be effective and impactful in your work. Um, and then we really wanna open up to questions. Um, you know, We have a few, but really hope that you guys can push us because I, I think I speak for the group here in saying that um, we don't look at this as a presentation in many ways. We look at this as an opportunity to learn from all of you because you guys are out there doing such um, kind of tremendous work. So I just will start out with, again, a little bit maybe on how this all kind of started. Um, you know, for over like the last 20 years, there's been a lot of evidence that has highlighted that young people who are getting outdoor experiences and those outdoor experiences, yes, they can be a deep wilderness experience, but also those neighborhood walks, those just times in the outdoors. There's so much evidence that's starting to show that it helps your health, both mental and physical education with like a 27% increase in science test scores from a study in California in about 2007. So all of this evidence is pointing towards that youth are benefiting from this time outdoors. And while there's been some awesome groups that have been working, a lot of them are represented here in trying to push this forward, there wasn't necessarily kind of a group that was working together to produce the tools to really get, make sure that young people had those opportunities to get outside. And we're gonna have some great representatives here, like Janie from the Outdoor Alliance for Kids that's been doing work for a lot of years. And I, I was a, a founding member of Oak with the Sierra Club. But we wanted to make sure that we could really build out this kind of coalition to get different voices, get knowledge, get engagement on how to build kind of a playbook that would really support 
grassroots and grass tops activists. So that means, you know, folks kind of on the ground running programs who want to make sure that they have ways to really connect kids to the outdoors, kind of grass tops folks who are maybe kind of decision makers, and also really give kind of a playbook that legislators in multiple states could use to kind of highlight examples of how they could get outside. So that was kind of the, the, the genesis of this coming together. Um, and it started in 2017. And kind of the group that has really helped kind of facilitate all of this is the Meridian Institute. Um, I'll, I'll let Robin talk a little bit more about them, but Meridian has really been critical because you know all of our parts of kind of our coalition have networks and are kind of engaged on kind of day-to-day -day kind of in, in the work, but the Meridian Institute's really played a role in kind of working with us, coalescing us, and making sure that we could kind of um, produce this tool. So I do want to just give, if it's okay with folks, kind of a quick just introduction to folks. I, I do hope that they can talk a little bit more about themselves, but um, Robin from the Meridian Institute is going to be kind of leading us through a little bit of the playbook, but I, I would just say, you know, Robin's a senior mediator and program manager with Meridian, um, and Robin just has extensive experience in international and national kind of work, and you know, we're, we're all a bunch of very passionate members of this team, and Robin's done an excellent job of uh, getting us to align and really produce a product. So in many ways, I'd say Robin's our fearless leader. Um, Sarah Bodor is the uh, North American Association of Environmental Education. She's the Director of Pol Policy and Affiliate Relations, and Sarah's just been a leading advocate uh, for over a decade of really engaging environmental education and policy, and I think uh, folks are going to learn a lot from Sarah today. Um, Dylan with the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, he'll talk a little bit more about NCL, he's the deputy director, but Dylan has a really kind of unique um, uh, world in this because he works directly with legislators. So I think it'll be great for folks to learn a little bit from Dylan because of kind of that role. Um, and Janie Rasmussen, she's the senior campaign manager for the Outdoor Alliance for Kids. And Oak is a, a really excellent example of an alliance that's brought together multiple organizations ranging from the American Heart Association to the Isaac Walton League to really coalesce around good policy uh, for young people. Um, and then last but definitely not least is a friend uh, and someone that I learn from every day, and that's James King. Um, James, you know, it's, it's hard to put James with like one title. I would just say activist extraordinaire. I've known James for over a decade uh, when he was actually working on an outdoor program uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And since then, James is now a, a master's uh, in urban environmental education, is from Atlanta, very proud as you can see, but also works in Seattle and has really kind of built up a lot of engagement and coalition building with different groups. And I think James is gonna give a really great kind of grassroots kind of perspective on all the work that we're doing. Um, so maybe there I'll hand it over to you, Robin. I see light coming down on me anyways in Seattle, which is a rarity, but would love Robin for you to maybe take us through a little bit of the playbook and give people some of those tools that we're talking about. That's great, thanks. Um, so like Martin said, this is really exciting because it's sort of a coalition of coalitions. The partners in the, that are represented in this group really bring lots of different perspectives on youth outdoor engagement and the specific uh, what specifically that means for youth outdoor policy and what kind of policies can really support getting kids outside. So uh, we've been together, our, our group has been meeting for about two years now. And one of the central things that we, like from the beginning, one of the visions was that we could pull together this policy playbook that does a couple of things. Um, and I will walk through it in just a second, but the ultimate goal is to help legislators and community leaders advance state policies that get more kids outside and um, broadly defined, <laughs> get kids outside. And we do that through highlighting some existing policy solutions, collecting and sharing new ideas and innovations. So this isn't just what's been done in other states, but it's what could be done in the future. And there's been, there's some fun ideas in there um, of things that have never been tried, but we think are really solid ideas that could be put in place. And then also to sort of make these connections between policymakers and local partners that might have a good idea that they're ready to, to, to sort of put in place and, and make those connections. Also to make connections across states so that somebody in Minnesota can learn from what has been done in Wyoming or vice versa and, and really get the, um, both the local partners and the state legislators uh, connecting there. Uh, let's see. So, oops, let me go ahead and share 
the actual playbook with you guys. Um, sorry, my. Okay, can you guys now see the, the playbook screen? I see some nods. So the playbook lives online, and I will include the link is both in our slides, but it's youthoutdoorpolicy.org. And so uh, should be accessible to everybody. And we tried to make the website easy to navigate and to kind of hone in on some key policy ideas. And so um, this is the home page. You can see there's some overview information and some links to some key um, components as well as some testimonials from uh, from various state legislators that have interacted with the playbook and have found it useful to inform their work. Um, so kind of fun to click through those and see how it's been put into place. We have this why youth outdoors section which really gives a good overview of the latest um, research on why kids and families and communities benefit from time outside. So it links to other resources. What we were not trying to do is um, be everything or duplicate some of the good work that's already been done by other organizations. So this is a great example where the um, North American Association for Environmental Education and the Children and Nature Network already had these really great research uh, research libraries that do a great job of synthesizing some of the information that's already out there. So we're just going to sort of piggyback on that and, and make that information accessible so that local advocates and leaders have that at their, their fingertips when they're looking to support a specific policy. Um, so, so lots of good resources there, some good infographics. We tried to emphasize easy, digestible information. Um, the real backbone of the playbook is what we're calling the policy framework. And so the policy framework is really sort of our collective shared vision or organization for how we see policies supporting getting kids outside. It's, it's centered around some key principles, things like it's child-centered, family-focused, multi-generational, uh, it, it includes equitable access for all. So really, these are sort of our guiding principles that tie all of the, the policies together and help us tell the difference between a good a bad and a great policy. Um, so if they if they sort of check all these boxes, then we're we're on board. We're enthusiastically behind it. Um, we recognize some of the benefits of youth outdoor policies. Um, so some additional information on that here. And then really the meat of it is the policy ideas are organized into these three buckets. So we have outdoor learning opportunities and environments, outdoor access and connection and systemic environmental literacy and education. So sort of how this fits into the public education or, or education systems in the US. And for any one of those, you can then click on it. And we have a bit more about second to load. I'm asking a lot of my internet these days. Um, so for any one of those, you'll get some good information about what policy ideas are out there, what's been tried in other states. Um, for outdoor learning, for example, there's a feature on the outdoor schools program that ensures and sets up a grant fund that supports every uh, every student in the Oregon public schools to get an outdoor experience as part of their public education. Um, there's all there's all kinds of ideas sort of buried in there. I, I think my internet has is officially overloaded or the website is overloaded. Um, you can also see, so I just clicked on policy opportunities. This is another great resource with lots of ideas embedded in it. There's some case studies. So these are things that keep rising to the surface as really exemplary policies that we thought would be fun to share with people. So you can look at and click on any one of those and it'll give you a real quick highlight of who did what, who's behind it, the contact information, how it's funded, just some real, some really key pieces of information on it. And then there's also this link, if you keep scrolling down on that page, to states in the lead. And this goes to a database that captures every state policy. Now, it only includes state policies that have passed. So this does not include some of those ideas that we think are really fun that could be put in place in the future. But it does include an interactive map where you can click on an individual state and get a sense of what policies um, have been put in place. It's a little bit. It's not optimized for my screen right now, but you guys can play around with that on your own. Um, and the idea is that when legislators or local advocates see cool things that have been done in other places, they can sort of quickly hone in on what they think they could do in their state. Um, and, and so hopefully this, this sort of shares a series of resources um, that allow 
you guys as people that are enthusiastic about getting kids playing <laughs> it gives it shares some of the best ideas that are out there um, i'm not going to go into details about the policy some of the policy ideas in here i would love if there were questions at the end about what you know what we think are really innovative but i do think as part of our next set of panelists we'll hear a little bit more about some of the policy ideas that are that um are frequently featured in the playbook and then i also just really encourage you guys to dive in on your own and look through the playbook and and um and that type of thing so i'll pause there pass it back to you martin thanks, thanks robin really appreciate it. and i think it is just important for folks to know again this is just a great resource really looking i think as robin said how can we connect that play movement uh you know with the work that that we're doing and like start to incorporate that in some of these policy ideas um you know next i, I think i'd really like to hear from from sarah um at NAAA north american associate of environmental education just to hear a little bit of kind of an overview of NAAA because i think you know they've been such a key and consistent um leader um, in this movement and talk maybe a little bit about some of the, a, a case study and and some of the things that you've seen from your perspective and and um, through your leadership, Sarah. Awesome. Thank you, Martin. And I don't know, Robin, if you're able to bring the slides up. I It doesn't matter. I can totally talk without them. But um, I just want to say that it's really great to be here with all of you. Um, I know that um, no one is happy about the circumstances that um, caused this conference to have to go online. But um, from our perspective, one of the um, you know, unexpected benefits is that uh, we, as a full partnership, are able to engage in this conversation with you all today. And we wouldn't have been able to do that um, had the conference been a physical convening. So for that, uh, I am grateful. Although again, um, you know, no one's happy <laughs> about the circumstances. Um, so I am Sarah Bodor, um, as you've already been told, I'm with the North American Association for Environmental Education, and we are the Professional Association for Environmental Educators, um, and many of you may already uh, know about environmental education, but many of those educators are actually outdoor educators, um, providing programming for children, families, and others in a variety of outdoor settings. Um, oftentimes they are providing programming through camps. Um, they may be running programs in parks. Um, they often are partnering with schools to offer programming, um, children's museums, nature centers, you name it. There are um, a myriad settings in which environmental education takes place. And, um, you know, at NAAEE, we really value lifelong learning. We talk a lot about environmental education being cradle to gray. Um, but um, we also really know and value those really early connections um, to nature through play and discovery that can have a lifelong impact on the values that um, um, a young person holds when they think about their relationship to the natural world. Um, and so we really believe that early connections are just incredibly vital um, in preparing the next generations of stewards um, of our natural world. Uh, but we also unfortunately know that those inequities um, start really early. So who has access to some of the um, richest outdoor learning and play experiences can be um, really uh, inequitable. And, and one of the ways um, at NAAEE that we've really been kind of looking at this issue um, is through something that we call the Natural Start Alliance, which um, is a program of NAAEE that is a network of early childhood educators um, who are interested in incorporating nature-based play um, into early childhood education settings. And um, our Natural Start team have been following a trend in the United States um, around nature-based preschool programming. And what they've seen is that over the last several years, there's just been an incredible spike in the number of nature-based preschool programs in the United States. Uh, it wasn't um, that many decades ago that there were exactly zero um, recognized nature-based um, early childhood education programs in the United States. And um, that number has grown dramatically over the last several years. Um, there were, it, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge number, but um, the, let's see if you, I don't know how well you can see this graph, but um, three years ago in 2017, uh, we uh, were able to register 250 
um, nature-based preschools and forest kindergartens. And just since 2017, when that survey was last done, we've just completed another survey. And in three years, that number has doubled. So there are more than 500 such programs um, formally um, in existence. There's at least one program in every state in the United States now. And so, um, you know, we think that this trend is really worth paying attention to. Um, and we also have seen that um, we are seeing an increased community of parent advocates for these programs. Um, but as I said, access to that programming is incredibly inequitable. Um, and so if you wanna, if you can click to the next slide, um, they may not be super easy to see on the screen, but you can essentially see that of those nature preschools and kindergarten programs, 83% um, of those are serving a white population of students. Um, and then the next uh, two graphs, which I find to be really difficult to read, um, show that in the top graph, um, more than half of those who responded to the survey um, reported that less than 5% of the students they're serving are dual language speakers. Um, and then similarly below that, um, well over half of the respondents reported that fewer than 5% of their students um, that they serve are receiving any special education services. So dramatic, um, or, you know, increase in interest in the programs, dramatic inequities in who actually has access to these programs. And so um, there are a lot of reasons for that um, inequity, but certainly one such um, barrier at the state level are the licensing requirements for nature-based um, preschool programs. Um, the requirements are very often focused on the physical facilities. Um, and um, in, in the case study that we um, will be putting up on the playbook site really soon, we focused on um, Washington State where um, they took a look at their licensing requirements and also found that um, the nature of the um, nature-based preschool programming did not allow for full day program licensing. And those of you who have young children who rely on preschool as part of your child care plan know that half day won't cut it. So <laughs> partial day programs uh, just don't work for many families. Um, and so uh, Washington has piloted uh, a program by which they have um, changed their licensing requirements to allow for um, these nature-based preschool programs to receive licenses. Um, and um, really importantly, um, not only does this, um, you know, incentivize uh, more programs to be created to allow for more children and families to participate in these programs, um, becoming licensed also gives those programs access to really critical federal and state funding. So previously, these programs didn't have access to any of the public funding that supports a lot of, a lot of other um, preschool and early childhood education programs. Um, and so um, I know a lot of states are looking at this particular policy. Washington is really being applauded for taking this step. And we really look forward to seeing how other states might approach this particular issue and start to try to address the barriers um, for pre providing um, these nature-based uh, educational programs. And the last thing I'll just say um, is that uh, one of the interesting sort of trickle up effects that we've seen of this um, growth in nature-based preschool programming is that as parents are uh, watching their children graduate from nature-based preschools and going on into public, um, you know, kindergarten, first, second, third grade programs, um, they're seeing the impact of the shift away from nature-based um, educational programming for their kids. And so they're becoming advocates in the public school system for more um, outdoor play and learning opportunities um, in those um, early, and early elementary school years. And I will um, stop there and turn it back over to you, Martin. Thanks, Sarah. And I would just say, uh, you know, NAAAE is a great network. They, they host a wonderful conference, which I think is one of the better gatherings of folks. I know could be different this year, but I really would look at some of the work that NAAAE is doing. Um, next, I'd actually like to kind of hand it over to Janie at the Outdoor Alliance for Kids. I think it's great that we talked a lot of kind of about this, you know, the state work and the state preschools. I think Janie can really give a great perspective from the Outdoor Alliance for Kids on the work they've done at a federal level that's actually starting to kind of starting to coalesce also at a state level. Um, so Janie, I'd love to hand it over for, to you to talk about that. 
Great. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for having me on the call today. We're really thrilled to join. Um, I do, Robin, I just realized I didn't send you uh, the slides for this. So I do have some slides if you if you want to share the screen over to me or else I'll just, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and just, I have the words in front of me. So I'll just go ahead and do that. I don't want to cause any sort of technological difficulties because I certainly wouldn't know how to uh, handle those. So you're welcome to try and share the screen if you want to really fast. And if that I just made you a co-host, so hopefully you can do that. Okay, great. Um, okay. Sorry about this. Just having a little slow computer issues. Might just start talking if it doesn't work soon. Apologies. Okay. Okay, here we go. All right, share screen, desktop. Okay, sorry, it's now it's going through all sorts of different <laughs> system preferences. So I might just go ahead and start talking. I'm sorry, everybody. I don't mean to hold us up. Um, so going to just go ahead here. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeannie Rasmussen. I'm the senior campaign representative for the Outdoors Alliance for Kids, or OAK. Uh, OAK was founded 10 years ago. So yeah, that's right. It's our 10th anniversary, our 10th birthday. And what a nice, you know, low key year to have it. Um, so stay tuned for some virtual opportunities to celebrate with us on our official birthday, which is June 1st. So as Martin said, Oak Stan started out with a handful of members, including Sierra Club, REI, the Isaac Walton League, Outdoor Foundation, the National Recreation and Park Association, and the Children and Nature Network. Um, and so since then, we've expanded to over 100 member organizations representing over 60 million individuals with our steering committee made up of some of those original members, as well as some new faces, including the Sierra Club, National Wildlife Federation, the American Heart Association, the YMCA of the USA, the Wilderness Society, Nature Bridge, Scholastic, the Alliance for Childhood, the Core Network, the National Recreation and Park Association, and Children and Nature Network. So a very robust multi-sector group of organizations and businesses. So Oak, Oak's, uh, Oak did a lot of uh, policy work from uh, the start. Um, Oak's humble first achievement was working with First Lady Michelle Obama and expanding her Let's Move Childhood Obesity Initiative to Let's Move Outside. And that day, the First Lady announced that Let's Move Outside is the day that uh, Oak officially launched, June 1st, 2010. And after helping to work, uh, to helping to establish Let's Move Outside, Oak was making consistent policy and advocacy wins in the youth outdoor access field. And by 2015, Oak had worked with the Obama administration and the National Park Service on implementing the Every Kid in a Park program. And if you are not familiar with Every Kid in a Park, it's the National Park Service program that provided fourth graders with a pass for free entry for them and their families for an entire year to national park sites and federal land sites. Um, the program was an immediate success. Uh, over 2 million kids downloaded the first pass just in the first year alone, and $5 million was leveraged in private funding in just a couple, the, the first start of it. And so, uh, you know, the program was really popular, but the program did face elimination in 2017 and 2018. And Oak successfully led efforts to save the program and later worked uh, to pass the Every Kid Outdoors Act of 2019, which changed the program's name from Every Kid at a Park to Every Kid Outdoors and authorized the program for seven years. So big win for our community. But for, of course, for every national park, there are hundreds of close to home state parks and beaches with entrance fees. And a handful of states already adopted the pass in their, for use in their state park systems or created their own pass as part of a larger promotion, uh, promotional campaign by National Park Service for their centennial and their other programs. Um, but there are 35 states that have entrance fees and do not accept the pass. And so a good example I like to use to put it in perspective is this means a fourth grader who lives in Pueblo, Colorado, a lovely city, uh, but one of the lowest income cities in the nation would have to travel an hour and a half to use their Every Kid Outdoors Pass at the nearest national park, but would have to pay to get into Lake Pueblo State Park, which is literally just outside of town. 
So as, uh, again, as part of the, national, uh, the promotion of that centennial, the NPS did ask states to extend the Every Kid Outdoors Pass to their state park systems, and some states did take up the offer. Um, Maryland, New York, Wyoming, and Idaho established uh, by taking administrative action by their state park directors and decided to accept the pass. But other states decided to implement their own pass for fifth graders so that fourth graders could experience national parks and then explore their state parks in the next grade. And those states are Nevada and New Mexico and they established this legislatively. And most recently, and I love this, a 10 year old student in Dallas, Texas, Dallas, Texas, Lily Kay, helped to pass a law implementing a similar program in her state. Uh, she knew that national parks are few and far between in the Lone Star State. Uh, they only have one true national park, Big Bend, and it's over a 10 hour drive from her home in Dallas. But there are over 80 Texas state parks, some of which were just a half an hour away from her house. So she wondered, can I use my Every Kid Outdoors Pass in Texas state parks? And unfortunately, the answer was no. Uh, Texas does allow free entry for kids 12 and under, but not that component that the Federal Every Kid Outdoors Pass has, where you can uh, letting your, their families as well. And it also would codify this into law if they, if they pass something like this. So with the answer being no, she decided to write her state representative, little Leslie Nope, pretty incredible, um, and proposed the K-Bill, which is an acronym for Kids, Active, Young, Brave, Intelligent, Leaders, and Learners. And the pill passed at the end of their legislative session, but unfortunately the provision that would have included families to receive free entry, like the Federal Every Kid Outdoors Pass, was stripped out at the last minute. So Oak is working with the K family to get that provision included in future administrative or legislative action. And we will be working across the country, and this is part of the case study that we're including in the Youth Outdoor Policy Playbook, is implementing policy change in states across the country, depending on the policy strategy that's needed in that state. And we're setting up state networks, both of Oak members and partners uh, on the ground level so that the efforts are more bottom up, so that we have grass tops leaders, but we also have grassroots participants and we're activating people from the bottom up. And we have draft executive orders for governors to take action, especially for state park systems that don't necessarily have the funding to be able to implement on their own or don't have authority, administrative action for state park directors that do not have that authority, and legislation for state assemblies. We're not stopping there. A key component of the campaign is to support state park funding and programming even in states that already have uh, free entry to their park systems. Um, and really, you know, now more than ever, it's really clear that close to home recreation uh, that state parks provide is a necessity and not a nice to have. And so we're really excited that our multi-sector network of organizations and businesses are working to expand uh, the, these policies across the country. And we do invite you all to learn more about it you can join the campaign if you'd like. Um, we're gonna be doing a lot of policy work and in, in establishing hopefully more case studies for the Youth Outdoor Policy Playbook as we uh, work to move this campaign. So go ahead and check us out at everykidoutdoors.org, which redirects you to the Outdoors Alliance for Kids website. And I'm excited, I see Sharon here has a, has a guest appearance from a, from a kiddo. So hopefully when they're in fourth grade, they'll be, they'll be able to visit their state parks with the Every Kid Outdoors Pass. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we're expanding this uh, campaign and making some policy efforts, both at the federal and state and local levels in response to COVID. But I know that that's part of uh, some of the panel discussion we might have later. Um, so thank you so much. I'm sorry that my slides didn't work out. I'm just not the most technologically apt. I even had this extra computer set up next to me. Um, but thank you so much for having me and I'm excited to answer any questions anybody might have. Thanks. Great, Janie. Um, you know, I think next maybe Robin will go, if you don't mind, like the NCLI in Washington. Uh, we'll talk about that really quick. Um, and James and I will kind of tag team that. I think Dylan will be great to kind of finish and talk a little bit about NCEL and how they kind of bring this together with um, legislators. So I don't know, Robin, if you have kind of that no child left inside Washington slide there, if we have that. Um, but just to give, you know, I kind of want to now, we've, I think it's, it's great that you heard from Janie again. I think it's an excellent example of the Outdoor Alliance for Kids 
really taking kind of a national idea and starting to really kind of move that, um, you know, into kind of the state level. And I will say having uh, a child in fourth grade that every kid in a park pass really has been uh, a critical way for her to connect to the outdoors. Um, just going to talk really quickly about kind of another case day. The No Child Left Inside actually started in Washington State, and it's something that James King and I have worked on. The idea behind No Child Left Inside is, frankly, the fact that there's just not many resources for programs that are trying to connect kids to the outdoors. So No Child Left Inside actually started in 2005 in Washington as a grant program to really give an opportunity for programs ranging from the Girl Scouts to programs serving refugees from Sudan to hunting and angling programs to have some state funding that's matched by private funding to get kids outdoors. I think what's interesting is that we've seen it grow in Washington from 500,000 up to 1.5 million. We actually were gonna get 2 million this year until the challenge of COVID and you know the supplemental budget did not get approved kind of due to that. But we're actually looking at ways with the governor's office and a really bipartisan team of folks on how can No Child Left Inside kind of be at the forefront of COVID recovery. But what I think is interesting about No Child Left Inside, and I hope that some of you can kind of, uh, you know, take this out of it, is that it's now expanded to multiple states. So starting in Washington, now Minnesota, Nevada have established No Child Left Inside grant programs, and Hawaii is actually looking to kind of um, extend that too. And Dylan might be able to talk a little bit about that. But I think one of the reasons I think it's really key that James is on this, this presentation is that James has not only been kind of an advocate for No Child Left Inside, which he has, but he has, I think, two roles that have been really critical that I'd love, James, for, for you to kind of talk about, you know, quickly. And that is, one, he's really kind of advocated for the need for equity to be at the center of No Child Left Inside, which I think is important for all of the, the, the legislation, all of kind of the initiatives that we're talking about. And secondly, James is actually on the No Child Left in, Inside Advisory Committee. And one of the things that we really wanted to do when we established No Child Left Inside is not just make it a government program that's just completely run by government, but to have a citizen oversight committee that really represents that diverse constituency, constituency of folks who benefit from the program. So James is actually someone who's scoring the grants and kind of helping with government officials and other coalition partners, both business and nonprofit, how that looks like. So James, I, I'd appreciate if you could maybe give a little bit of your perspective um, from both an advocacy aims and a little bit from how you've been on, on top of that coalition. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, once again, James King from Atlanta, Georgia, based in Seattle, Washington. Uh, go by he, him pronouns. Uh, happy Ramadan for those. And I uh, definitely want to give thanks to uh, Native Americans and the land in which we all are on right now. Uh, when we talk about ag advocacy and we talk about uh, engagement, it's really who's at the table and who's not at the table um, and how we can bring those individuals in from different abilities, uh, from different strengths, people that we know in the community should be in, in a, have a voice at the table. Um, we know uh, that um, we don't have enough youth standing up and, and speaking for themselves. So bringing, bringing youth to the table as well, um, because I think one thing is uh, we talk about protecting them and they're not at the table to understand uh, the legislation and the policies themselves uh, to be at the table. And, and we need to create those uh, metrics so they can step in and they can understand uh, what they're protecting, how they're protecting the history and culture of what they're protecting so they can leave for the next generation behind. Um, those are a couple of things that I do. Uh, that I love to to present. And even though um, I'm speaking about youth, there's also people around that are around my age that have families um, and they uh, love the outdoors, but they see that their outdoor spaces are changing um, from their neighborhoods, changing from kids being out in the streets uh, playing and then police is calling on them because they're out in the streets and playing until their neighborhood's getting gentrified um, to bike lanes. And then they're like, well, we was riding bikes and we was playing outdoors, but police is called. And now uh, we have these th uh, formal th uh, lanes to, to ride bikes in. I think in the advocacy part is, is really bringing um, a lot of people to the table to just really speak up uh, and be able to have those tools of how to speak, um, how to talk, uh, how to meet their representatives outside of uh, when they go to the voting box. What are the next steps after you hit uh, yes or no for, for that candidate or whoever you wanna speak to? So uh, on the advocacy part, I'm really into 
really engaging diverse groups and bringing them into the table so they can so they can be able to talk about policies in the, in the outdoors um, from the local end and all the way up to uh, the federal end and, and what it's like and also help them. Um, I, I'm not saying that I empower them because they already have the power themselves, but actually uh, allowing them uh, to blossom in their own range uh, so they can get out and, and be great advocates. So we look at it, uh, we look at it as a perspective um, that uh, these people don't know, but yet and still, I think um, when we talk about certain people and certain groups, they know uh, they just don't have the platform to get there in the voice. I think one of the things um, that I tested out uh, for the state of Washington, and I know Martin was there when we did the No uh, Child Left Inside Day, Advocacy Day. Um, I actually took the, I actually took a bus, a train, another bus uh, to get out there to the uh, Advocacy Day. Um, this took me close to three and a half hours to do so. Yes, I have the ability and I have the privilege to uh, rent a car or get a car to get there in 45 minutes or less from Seattle to Olympia. But I actually chose to do that to see how long does it really take. And that's, um, that is a barrier itself, um, how people can go to uh, their state capital just to uh, vouch for themselves and advocate for themselves and their communities. So we have to think about those barriers and, and how people can get across the state uh, to their state capital or the, how they can reach their legislators so they can talk about getting outdoors and the significance of getting outdoors. And then Martin, you also talked about uh, the, the uh, RCO, No Child Left Inside grants. So uh, I think one of the biggest things that um, I noticed that uh, when I sat down at this table, a lot of organizations were talking about how the same organizations are applying uh, for this grant. So for me to be a person who is uh, scoring these grants and knowing that it is something for uh, the residents of Washington, I started reaching out to groups, groups that heard about it, groups that haven't heard about it, and saying, hey, you need to apply. Uh, some groups were hesitant uh, because they know or they have a feeling that they would never get it. Uh, the grant, but I, I pushed them. And also I pushed uh, RCO to not only uh, look at who is well, them accepting, but creating a, a system where they can help people through the process. Um, I think the great thing about our panel is our panel is separated from the organization who is receiving and, and, and giving out the grants. So our panel can have a great outreach um, and the, the, the grantees or the RCO um, they can really assist uh, individuals. So um, reading, reaching out to people on the eastern side of Washington who the grant levels are really low of who apply for No No Child Left Inside funds and saying, hey, telling this native group or this uh, hook and bullet group that you should definitely apply, uh, that you should definitely look at it because not only we need to see those numbers uh, rise, but uh, we need to talk about the equity in, in which people receive funds. And some of these groups were advocating since day one and still receiving funds and not saying is not uh, that they shouldn't, but I'm saying that uh, there's other groups that do the similar work uh, that are struggling, that are making things happen with $500 uh, versus $5,000 in which they can have successful programs. So reaching out to that, um, I think on, the, on another basis that I really want to talk about is when uh, we look at how we score grants. Um, I know the perspective I have, but we different, uh, different people who score grants or look at these processes, um, lift it, look at it from different perspectives. So coming together and try to have common language um, to uh, talk about what is justice, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, or justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, what we call the JEDI movement, um, is, is something that we need to take a focus on as well. That's why I love in the process of scoring, we kind of score by ourselves, but we come back and we look at all of it together. Uh, that's because if anybody have questions on any of the grants um, that we go through, we can ping pong and we can use each other's knowledge um, going moving forward. So uh, that is a little bit, I don't, I don't want to be respectful of time, but I'm always game for, for more and more questions of, of how I, I do these things. But in particular, I work with uh, communities, uh, K through gray and corporate responsibility all surrounding the environment. So thank you.
Thanks, James. And, and, you know, I know, Stephanie, we have an 830, but, you know, maybe we'll, if people are willing to stay on, I want to make sure we answer questions. I think I, I do want to hand it to Dylan. I do want to say with James, again, he has a unique network um, of folks in the Jedi world, also in the education world. And um, I think James can just give great advice and support on some of the things that he talked about. Again, he's kind of lived it and also connected and empowered, I think, a lot of folks around that. Um, I'd really like now to kind of hand it over to, to Dylan at the National Cox Environmental Legislators, because we've all talked kind of from a coalition basis and kind of an individual basis about this work on how to kind of, you know, engage in outdoor legislation. But Dylan has a unique perch with the National Cox Environmental Legislators because his constituency is actually the legislators. Um, so he's really brought in, um, you know, over um, kind of that kind of engagement. So Dylan, I'd love you to kind of maybe give a little bit of background on NCL and how you see the Youth Outdoor Policy Playbook kind of help supporting kind of your work with uh, the legislators in your extensive network across the country. Wonderful, thank you, Martin. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll try and be pretty brief here and then we can go into some questions, but NCEL, we're a nationwide network of over 1200 state legislators across the country focused on conservation and environment issues. Uh, we organize legislators between states for shared learning and action on a whole variety of issues in climate and energy, conservation, environmental health, and really it's helping legislators figure out what's been successful in one state, what are the best models, what are the best practices, how can they learn from each other to figure it, to replicate good ideas and implement policies that are gonna be effective for people in their communities and the environment and everything all in one. I think it's, in, a lot of people don't realize just how most of the state legislators are part-time and very few of them actually have legislative staff. And it's the, the difference between your state legislators and Congress is giant and Many times when I talk to state legislators, it's their cell phone that I'm talking on, or they're calling me and they're cooking dinner uh, and while, while they're talking on their cell phone. And um, it's, they're, they're very accessible. And I think that it's, it's something where people don't realize just how much they're trying to balance. And so what we try and do is be that remote environmental staff for legislators to help them learn about good ideas and connect with people on the ground and coalitions and people like the ones on this call. And that's where this playbook has been phenomenal because it gives this whole toolkit for legislators to pick up and say, what are some good ideas out there? I know that I'm interested in environmental education. Or I know I'm interested in getting kids outdoors and finding ways of increasing that access, but what are the tools? What can I actually do? Because meanwhile, this legislator is balancing budgets and criminal justice reform and healthcare and COVID and everything. And so it's really important to be able to provide some really tangible solutions. A couple examples of that, Martin mentioned how No Child Left Inside is being replicated. And so we play that role of really helping support that replication and idea sharing. For example, in Minnesota, in Nevada, um, in Hawaii, a lot of these conversations started at our forum where legislators were having conversations with each other. Um, and so like in Hawaii right now, it's, it was a legislator who attended a nas NCEL national forum, heard about NCLI in Washington, said, I wanna do that, took it back and it passed the Senate in Washington, sorry, in Hawaii and um, might, uh, we'll see where it goes depending on COVID when they reconvene. Nevada was the same case where a legislator came and heard about Washington, started talking with people on the ground, got connected with the local groups in Nevada and made that a success. And so I think examples like that are where we try and be that conduit behind the scenes to make sure good ideas are replicated, but also knowing that once the bill's introduced, we, we are in a lobbyist group. We're not the ones that are on the ground that are gonna be able to provide the testimonials, the support, the NCLI days like in Washington. So really look at ourselves as key partners of people on the ground, but trying to provide that capacity for legislators. Um, COVID is changing things quite a bit. I think we are trying to understand exactly what this means for legislators as they are for themselves and what this will mean for state legislative sessions. A few things we're hearing um, I think one is how much this is shining a light on inequ inequitable access to nature, something that's come up a lot today. So how can policies find ways of increasing that to make sure we have community resilience in terms of outdoor wellness opportunities and access um, for future pandemics, but also just for day-to-day -day life. I think something that states are gonna be looking at in the next year is gonna be policies that have low fiscal notes, so that cost very little money, knowing that state budgets are gonna be really challenged by this. And that's where some of these policies that are in here, like the Outdoor Preschool Licensure Program or um, Every Kid Outdoors Act for fourth graders, these are things that cost a very small amount of money, but have a very large impact. And so trying to find some of these solutions and highlighting those has been something that our coalition has been working on. And finally, really looking at these outdoor wellness benefits of outdoor time uh, for play, for engagement, and making sure that it's something that's highlighted and that's connected in, I think really opens up opportunities and helps legislators talk to their peers about why uh, outdoors is not only good for 
um, people just wanting to go for a walk, but also for building resilience. It's good for local businesses, the economy, all these things. And telling that story is really important. So that's a little bit about NCEL and some of the work we've done. I see we're right at the bottom of the hour or the 8.30 mark. So I wanna um, stop there and turn it back over to Martin and happy to help answer any questions. Thanks. Um, you know, I will say all of us actually were on a call after this. So we are happy, I think, to stay on with the group. Again, we really are here to answer you. And I know that there's been some great stuff going on in the chat room. Um, so I'll just kind of end kind of our formal uh, presentation, I guess, with, with this. I'd say just know uh, people who are kind of attending this that, again, this is a, a group of folks that, yes, we kind of have a, a little bit of resources to kind of come together, but this has been a true team effort. And I would just say when you are thinking about, you know, working in kind of this space or any space, like really kind of jumping in and working with partners can make the impactful work. And I think if you look at all the, the backgrounds of the different organizations and the different people who kind of created the Youth Outdoor Policy Partnership and the playbook, it really is kind of a diversity of thought and really trying to kind of bring together different organizational missions and personal values uh, to make this effective partnership. And I think it has really started to kind of make that impact, both the grassroots, the grass tops, and at that legislative level. Um, so I will just say thank you to all of the, the yacht members and the team. Um, you guys are incredible. It's awesome to see you and, and work with you, especially during this time. Um, and so Stephanie, I'm happy to kind of, you know, help take some questions. Um, I'd appreciate maybe your help, Stephanie, on, on moderating. I want to make sure people do get that time. So, um, you know, Stephanie, maybe let me know the best way to kind of start, you know, having those questions that I really do want to hear from the people attending. I think, you know, we have some questions if no one asked, but I, I have a feeling this group will have a few questions for our esteemed panelists. Yeah, well, definitely want to make sure that folks have a chance to uh, to pipe in. If um, if you want, you can use your little hand raising uh, reaction there. But I saw in the chat there was a question from um, Ellen. It says, "How do we get access to outdoor spaces for people who do not have cars and who do not live in the area where there is robust public transportation?" Great question. Um. So sorry, was somebody going to answer that? I, I'll just quickly say that I think that that is part of the federal and state policy asks that we're making is that we do increase public transportation options, but also alternative transportation options, including safe routes to parks and some grant programs for park adjacent nonprofits to transport uh, the communities they serve directly to state and national parks. Um, and then, of course, the, the local park side is, is making sure that there is a connected trail system or a transportation system that gets people connected to it safely. I'll add yeah. to that in New York and California, there have been conversations about trying to better utilize school buses when they're not in service and getting those as access points to get kids outdoors. Um, New York, I think, has a, a grant program for teachers and California had it included in part of a bill that unfortunately got vetoed as a larger package. But I think some of this transportation access points are going to be coming up more and more as that conversation progresses. And, and I would like to chime in. Um, I, I, I love to think about uh, what the government is doing, how they can step up, but um, how we can create entrepreneurs in, in this arena too. Uh, so individuals that are in that community, um, you know, how can we create a job of a, a access job to maybe get somebody on a Saturday to bus people uh, to a, a certain level and create a job platform for them. Um, this is how some of the organizations have started before some of the touring companies started uh, way back when to get people to national parks. So uh, we can still continue to do that uh, for the community and, 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 cre and create those resources. Um, so it's not only to think about it on the federal and the state end, but um, like how can we create job opportunities in this, uh, in this arena for individuals as well? Great. Thanks, James. Um, Stephanie, maybe I'll step up. I see a really good question um, from uh, Delfina, which is what has been done for kids with disabilities kind of in this space? Um, I'll take that really quickly because I, I would say it's a great question. I'd say when you look at like no child left inside in Washington, you are going to get more points if you, as a program, 
if your program is actually focusing and serving on young people um, who are struggling or, or, or challenged with disabilities. And I'd also uh, point to an LBC Action Partner Wilderness Inquiry um, based out of Minneapolis, which really was, was created. And it kind of comes to what James said a little bit. Right? It was created because there was not an, an opportunity for a lot of young people who were dealing with the challenges of disabilities to get that outdoor connection. And the government was struggling to, and Wilderness Inquiry on its own kind of really helped change some of the state laws around kind of uh, engagement with young people with disabilities. So they're a great organization to look for. But I would say I think there's a focus among this group of making sure that we really make sure that people who are having those challenges are getting the support they need and getting a little bit, um, uh, again, of that e extra support to make sure that they qualify for some of these outdoor programs. And I, I would just like to add an example um, that's fairly new and emergent um, in several school systems in Virginia that's being funded by grant um, program or grant program through NOAA, the federal agency, um, to support professional learning um, that brings um, outdoor educators together with um, the, the special education teachers that are providing classroom assistance um, so that they are learning together about how they can adapt their outdoor uh, watershed education programs um, specifically for certain um, populations within the school system. Um, and I'll just add that uh, it's, it's not a direct policy solution, but uh, increased funding for national, state, and regional and local parks means that they can make transfer, they can make infrastructure improvements. Um, surfacing and contracting is one of the most expensive things for park agencies, and it's what it's the things that make things accessible for children with disabilities. Um, there are a number of park agencies doing incredible things with small amounts of money to do that. And I did want to highlight just for, for folks, because there's a state park system that I'm really excited to see developing an autism nature trail. So it's called the ANT at Letchworth State Park. And I'd encourage everybody to see an example of a very, a relatively low budget project that's serving um, children with autism in particular. Excellent. I think that um, Sarah had uh, said something in the chat box that was related to some another question in the chat box about um, efforts to improve and promote the use of school grounds and community spaces. Um, I guess when school's not in session, you want to explain on that at all? I'd um, say, oh, oh, go ahead, please. No, go ahead, Martin. Um, I would just say a great resource has Children Nature Network, which has done a ton of work. I think NAAAA has been also very heavily involved in like green schoolyard development. So that's a, a, a great resource, but I'd, I'd love to hear kind of uh, thoughts and questions. From you. So I think there are a number of initiatives that are looking at um, improving school grounds, both to make them you know, more useful for play and learning, uh, but also um, making them accessible to um, the surrounding community, whether it's, as you said, Stephanie, on the weekend, um, in, in after school hours, um, so that, you know, hopefully that's kind of like nearby nature that is accessible to a lot of folks. Um, and I, I do know this is, you know, not the only source of, of funding to be able to do it, but um, currently mm -hmm. under federal education policy and the Every Student Succeeds Act, um, some of the grant funding can be used for environmental education. And so I know the school system that my children attend, for example, um, they took some of that funding and are developing outdoor classrooms at every single middle school. Um, and so um, they are working to create improved spaces that again, not only facilitate better learning opportunities, but allow um, the kids and the community to have access to, um, you know, a meaningful outdoor um, space to spend time I can, I can say uh here in atlanta we work on uh, a couple of projects with the west atlanta watershed alliance with creating rain gardens um and also creating gardening projects but with the rain gardens you have to um, i know some of the things that we have and some of the obstacles we go through is creating an educational package not only for the teachers who support it but also the maintenance workers um, because they come out and they're uh, cutting grass like usual and they might be cutting those things, uh, those natural things that we want to keep, um, those ed educational areas that we see 
um, that is, that is uh, expanding on knowledge, but they just see it as weeds or something else. So um, when we, uh, some of the barriers that I, that I have seen is not only that, but also when we have gardens and the summer times, uh, who will maintain it? Um, because that is when a lot of the uh, workers and, and uh, people who have keys to the buildings, they're gone for the summer. So um, creating those respectful boundaries um, to know that it will be maintained um, for when the school, between when the school year ends and when the school year begins um, is something that, you know, I always looked at and, and uh, things that we came across. Um, and things we had to overcome. So um, I'm definitely down for doing stuff in schoolyards and those green areas, um, but being respectful of the ones who are, are there majority of the year and, and uh, their perspectives as well. So, yeah. Thanks, James. Um, I wanna say I love also the fact that like on this chat, like I wanna now go to the Swamp Rabbit Trail in Green Greenville. This looks yes. awesome when I can someday. Uh, I see a really good um, question from Amy Rule about um, how do we bring program nature experiences to, to young uh, to people in prison? I want to just give an example of a group that I work with on that because that might sound like how does that happen? But um, I work with a group here in Seattle called the Nature Project. James is actually familiar with them. It's a group that uh, was started by a former NFL player named Cooper Helfit. Sorry, went to Duke, so he's a, a rival of you guys that you guys always beat at Clemson. Um, but <laughs> we, we also beat them at basketball. I'm just gonna put that out there. Oh wow! Sorry, Ooh. sorry, I had to go there. <laughs> Ball, but I don't I don't know how oh, many man. I digress but the nature project has really um, been focused on you know athletes have kind of a lot of credibility in circles um, that people maybe wouldn't assume with the outdoors but Cooper's created a network um, around the country of different mainly NFL players who are working with young people highlighting the benefits of the outdoors and one of his big focuses in King County has been with juvenile offenders in the King County prisons and I think James actually has a, a lot of background this while it would be intuitive that you're in prison your limited outdoor time he's really worked with them to highlight how in the outdoors even creating a small garden plot outside together and kind of bringing community create some like really good responsibility and i think um another example would be that actually one of the no child left inside grantees was the clark county juvenile detention center and they actually applied for a no child left inside grantee grant because and it's kind of a as james said it's a rural part of washington but they applied because they saw this as a strategy that could really help the mental and physical health of some of these detainees. And it's really interesting in the first year of their study, they actually found a 45% of uh, non-retention rate for young people who participate in those programs, which at that level is like 25% higher than folks who did not um, participate in that. So it's a great question um, and happy to give some more of those resources, Amy, um, if you have any other questions. Yeah, I, I want to do a, a shameless plug right now. Uh, Shark Therapy was started by uh, Jared Manos and West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. And I think uh, one of the things that um, I came into the program uh, to do is help take formerly incarcerated young adults um, and take them to understand about the watershed. And then at the end of the program, we go down to Jupiter, Florida uh, to go snorkeling um, and then they come back up here to Atlanta uh, to go uh, to go diving in the shark tanks uh, or the tanks in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Georgia Aquarium. So, uh, you know, due to the times right now, um, and then also funding is is short to do this uh, program. But um, this is something that we pushed out in, into September this year, and I think it's a it's a great program. Jeremy Manos did a lot of work in Texas by restoring the prairie lands. Uh, and prairie dogs with uh, formerly incarcerated people. So yeah, when we talk about nature and getting people out, uh, those are the things that, you know, uh, those are the people that are are looked at a lot in negative light. But I think the reason why we call it shark therapy because people have fears of sharks, no, people have fears of um, certain individuals and, and how we can change those narratives and how we can bring people, uh, bring that light back yeah, into the community. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely, uh, definitely. Uh, like I said, I wanted to bring the shameless plug on on shark therapy. Thanks. Um, thank you, James. I appreciate it. Um, so I think we'll probably like kind of wrap up in a couple minutes here. I know we've gone a little bit over. I appreciate everyone um, sticking <laughs> with us. I okay. saw two questions. Okay, great. Maybe we'll do okay. final two more questions. One from Jennifer Smith and one from Amy Roll. Sounds great. Jennifer, do you want to unmute? If she's still here, I saw a hand earlier. Or we'll go with Amy while I see her. You want to 
ask your question real quick? Oh, you're applauding. That wasn't reason. Awesome. All right. Well, Heidi Co uh, Cohen with um, Trust for Public Land has a question wanting to know about funding for the shark therapy and similar programs. Um, I would ask Heidi, where, Heidi, where are you based? I'm just curious on what state you're based in. She's muted. Okay. You nationwide. can talk if you want. Um, no, nationwide, I would just say, I okay. mean, I think nationwide, I might hand it over to Janie a little bit on that. I think she might have kind of the best federal perspective. I was just going to say, I know TPL does a lot of work in Georgia, and we're trying to kind of create some work in Georgia for fun programs that would like be like the shark pit therapy program in, in Georgia. But Janie, maybe you have some some thoughts, if not an answer on that. I don't know if I have an answer. James, I don't know. Did you, did you have a specific answer to that? I thought you were about to say something, so I don't want to proceed that. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can go and I, and I can build from there. So okay, John, great. do it. Well, this is the first I'm um, hearing of shark therapy. And for me, I went, when I went shark cage uh, snorkeling, um, it was more of immersion therapy for me because I am th terrified of sharks. Um, <laughs> but it sounds really cool. Um, yeah, I think that the overall appropriations uh, for federal agencies that are doing grant programs to park adjacent nonprofits is really key. Um, including like what met, what Sarah mentioned before, which is with NOAA and uh, other organizations that are, are sub-granting. But other than that, I don't have a really good answer. And uh, specific um, nonprofits tend to give grants. I think that would be uh, specific to something like a therapy program. But I would love to hear, James, if you have anything to, to add to that. Man, so right now, and, and we're building funds. So we have uh, some organizations who have, have given um a thousand or two um but we still are building so we are looking at grassroots um and also we're looking at uh da offices or i mean um oh man we're looking at um ooh man is it da or pa offices i'm sorry um we're, we're looking at the judicial system and seeing what they can uh, provide and they can bring in if they have resources uh, for those arenas too. So though um, right now it, it is, it's a new, I can't say it's new, but um, I think a lot of people haven't at or brought up the environment and uh, formerly incarcerated individuals and so, um, and funding resources for it. So like I said, we're, we're working on grassroots. We're looking at other agendas. We're bringing up this towards foundations um, and we're just slowly doing it. Um, and, but a, a lot of it is grassroots. A lot of it is community people saying, hey, we want to see this change and we want to be a part of it. And so we'll give a dollar or two or, you know, how much, how much we can to see um, productive citizens in our community. Right. And James, Thanks. I just wanted to add to that really quickly because that made me think of uh, how there are federal Department of Justice grants going out that are a little bit more um, you know, similar to this, including I know of a, a um, an opiates prevention program that they're doing that's a mentorship grant that's being granted out to park and rec agencies. I know of this just because I worked at the National Recreation and Park Association previous to this, um, but I do love to see those efforts in specific and I think that more more action needs to be taken from groups that see solutions from that that can be made of asks up to the Department of Justice. I think this administration hasn't been as friendly to new proposals, but I think certainly in the future there could be some opportunities for asking for specific grant dollars for programs that aren't punitive. So, mm -hmm. thanks. thanks. Um, so I do want to make sure everyone's uh, you know stayed on. I think a little bit longer. Really appreciate first of all. This, the Play, U.S. Play Coalition. Thank you for giving us this platform, Stephanie. We are so appreciative. Um, you know, again, I think it'd be great to take this, and I think all of us on this call, especially from the Yo perspective, you know, we're all about the action. So figuring out ways that we can really start to bring play to the forefront of some of the stuff that we're doing, I think, would be excellent. I do really want to thank all of the of the panelists again for giving their time. And I actually would like—I'm not don't mean to put her on the spot. I, I you know, Robin was very great in kind of outlining the, the playbook, but again, she is in some ways our fearless leader. So, Robin, if there's any kind of last words that you'd like to talk about is like where you see kind of the playbook going and any thoughts you have on how the play coalition can engage i just want to make sure that you potentially get that last word thanks martin i would just say that i would love everyone on this call that hasn't seen the playbook before to take a look at it and if you know of state policies that you think should be in there or if you have a really great idea for a po state policy or an idea something that should be featured on there 
then shoot us an email. And I think my email address is buried somewhere in that playbook. We can also uh, share with you guys through other means, but I, it really is intended to be a collective group effort. And so it would be great to tap into this network's um, deep knowledge and expertise and, and sort of incorporate that there. So thanks, thanks, it's been great. Thanks, Robin, really appreciate it. My final word would just be, please everyone stay healthy, stay safe, and most importantly, think about the word that we're all rallying on today, and that is play. So I hope you all yes. get to play with your family, play a little bit, you know, socially distancing with your friends, and uh, thank you again, Stephanie, so much for the opportunity. Absolutely, and thanks, Martin, to you and to everybody on the, the panel. I am I would like to uh, figure out how to get our, um, consortium added to your consortium of consortiums of consortiums of consortiums. So um, absolutely. I mean, I, I Oh, you said that six times in a row blows me away, but I'm yeah, very, yeah. I get, it felt like, like the, um, like the stacking, the Russian stacking dolls. That's what I sort of saw there, as I said, <laughs> in my mind's eye. But um, I love that we have finally found each other, even though all of us were sort of like, how is it that we have not found each other before? Um, so, so glad that you were able to tell us all about your individual organizations as well as um, the playbook um, because it's, it's a perfect piece um, to what we're doing here. So thank you all and thanks for your extra time and, um, and y'all have a great weekend. Thank you, thank everybody. You, Stephanie. Thank you, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care, everyone. Take care. Take care.